בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, we're back to uh, our Wednesday night, סתם את הרבי, where after a few דברי תורה, you guys will בעזרת השם uh, ask some questions, הקדוש ברוך הוא בעזרת השם will give us uh, the answers. Tonight's you uh, will be for a רפואה um, שלמה for רבנית לבנה, בת שרה, uh, אבי מורי דוד בן עשריה, דוריס בת ג'ורה. רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית שרה בת ענת, אורית בת אילנה, ליאורה בת ליאל, עזרא בן בתיה, and also for הצלחה רבה of מרשה בת ג'וליה, איילה בת מרשה, סמל בן מרשה, ספס בן מרשה, אלכסנדר בן מרשה, לואיס בן מרשה, שאול בן פרזנה, יתרו בן אברהם, אושרי בן דוריס, גבי בן דוריס, אלעד בן דוריס, אמיר בן שאהין, and all of Am Yisrael and all of the righteous Noahides that continue to do whatever is necessary to do the will of Hashem. אשריכם ואשריך את כיכם, הקדוש ברוך הוא יברך את כולכם בכל מכל כל. So we have uh, in front of us פרשת תרומה, ויקחו לי תרומה. We have a uh, פרשה that uh, more or less when you first look at it you're trying to figure out How is this parasha relevant to my life? I understand it's part of the Torah. I understand we need to uh, build the Bet HaMikdash. Uh, I understand we need to do a lot of different things, but what about me? How uh, I'm not building the Bet HaMikdash. I'm not building the Mishkan. How could I take something from this parasha? So, of course, uh, the, uh, anyone that read uh, Rabbi Ephraim's book, uh, the Asicha um, Shavuit, he has uh, several ideas uh, on every single parasha. In the Torah, for anyone that uh, knows how to speak Hebrew and uh, should definitely order these books from the website, it's free. Go to kiruvstore.com or .org, uh, kiruvstore.org, and get yourself a, a set of these. You can give out and do chesed la'am Yisrael to give them uh, some uh, books for free. Um, so he has a bunch of ideas over there. And uh, uh, of course, one of the things that a person needs to understand is that the Torah... is an endless ocean and there's uh, something to learn from every single pasuk in the Torah every aspect of it every parasha has prophecy every parasha has secrets that are relevant not only relevant to you but relevant to you now right this second this week and when you read the parasha uh, uh, one of the Mekubalim I heard this uh, first hand from uh, Arav Shani who is a uh, one of the Mekubalim of this generation He says that when you read the weekly parasha and you fulfill the mitzvah uh, and the obligation uh, that the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, that every Jew has to read the w- weekly parasha twice and once with commentary, preferably commentary by Onkelos. Uh, but uh, if you don't have Onkelos, you could read the, uh, the Rashi, and that's, uh, that's uh, more than enough. Uh, but nonetheless, when you, uh, Rav Shani says that when you read the weekly parasha, You're in essence creating specific angels that will give you certain strength uh, for that week that you can't get and in your life that you can't get any other way. Uh, there's an extraordinary amount of kedusha that uh, is generated from reading the weekly parasha and that's why we mention it on a regular basis because I know that there's a lot of people Baruch Hashem that watch our shiurim, that have done tshuva, that have bachurim in yeshivot and kolels and so on. Uh, and are very good at learning Gemara or learning Musar or learning a lot of different things, but for whatever reason or another, uh, put the Chumash, the five books of Moses, on the, uh, on the back as the, uh, you know, when I get a chance type of uh, uh, ideology. And it's uh, really nothing further from the truth. Uh, in fact, it's more of an obligation uh, to learn the weekly uh, parasha than it is to learn anything else. Anything else, because this is a Psaq Al-Akha, you have to learn. Of course, you also have to learn, as we read uh, in last night's Shiu, the Mishnah Burai and the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, that a person has to learn Musar every day. And of course, you have to learn al because how are you going to uh, uh, know how to apply the Musar if you don't learn al So of course, you have to learn everything. But here, to, to, for a person to not learn the weekly parasha is, in essence, a person that will never achieve any sense whatsoever of where he came from, where she came from, and where they're going. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's critical for a person to learn uh, the weekly parasha. Of course, the obligation is on men, uh, you know, women, 
are not obligated to learn the weekly parasha, although it's definitely very good, but they don't have that same obligation. But uh, I would say women that have, uh, you know, that are single or uh, women that have less responsibility, more time on their hands, instead of chit-chatting a bunch of Lashonara on the telephone and going to coffee shops, surely it's much better for you to w- read the weekly parasha and know where you came from. Uh, the uh, One of the uh, uh, very uh, uh, successful zgulot uh, that's already from yesteryear, it's from many, many years ago, but was, uh, you know, had a rebirth in our generation uh, by... Uh, Arav uh, Yeshayahu Pinto, Sheikh Yeh, a Gaon Tzadik of this generation. Uh, I remember when I first uh, uh, started uh, going, you know, doing tshuva. I used to go to a shurim every Tuesday night. And uh, so Arav Pinto gave a rebirth to a very famous skula to learn Sefer Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy, the entire book on Shabbat. And many people have taken it on to learn this uh, Sefer, why Sefer Dvarim? This is the Sefer of Moshe Rabenu. It has a lot of uh, Musar in it, a lot of Kedusha in it. Uh, but again, even this Skula, uh, there are hear that there are certain people that take on this Skula and they read the book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Dvarim, on Shabbat, and sometimes they read it in sections during the week, and that's all great. And it could definitely uh, be an addition and a benefit to your life, but it is not as important as reading the weekly parasha. Uh, as great as uh, reading Sefer Dvarim is, it's not as important. It's not an obligation. It's a sgula. Obligation is what comes first. And a person is obligated to learn the weekly parasha. And as I said, the Mekubalim specifically say that when a person reads the weekly parasha, really delves into it, not just reads it superficially just to get finished. Read the commentary. Know what's going on. Connect to it. Try to figure out Who's, who's, who's talking, who, what, where, and how, how, you know, all these different things, toil in it and toil in it because everything is in it, says the Mishnah in Avot. And a person such as this will, uh, will end up having a, a lot of chidushim and, of course, have an opportunity to potentially become a Talmit Chacham one day because there is no such thing as a Talmit Chacham who does not know Chumash. No such thing. So uh, the, that reality does not exist. So the uh, Parashat Truma, although it talks about the Mishkan and all of the different intricate details of building the Mishkan, building the, uh, the Menorah and all the Kelim and everything else, surely it has an enormous amount of teachings in it that we can have. As Rav uh, uh, Ephraim brings uh, first and foremost is the popular teaching where it says, li Truma, and they take for me a... Uh, 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 a, uh, a a portion they take from me i mean usually you would say they would give and when you give you know when you when it, when the issue is uh it's daka you give tzedakah you don't take tzedakah no no when you give tzedakah you're really taking tzedakah why because anyone that understands even the basic minimum requirement of what it means to believe in God knows that no matter what you do, HaKadosh Baruch Hu potech et yadav masbiya bekol chayratzon. HaKadosh Baruch Hu opens his hands and feeds all of those that, are, that, uh, that want life, that need life. Hashem feeds all of his creation. So the, whether you give somebody that needs the uh, money, or you don't give it to them, HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't need you. In essence, when we give, we're taking. In essence, what we're doing is that since Hashem is going to give this person, this animal, this, uh, this entity, whatever it needs, uh, based on, of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's calculations, when we decide to donate money, when we decide to donate our time, when we decide to donate our, uh, our skills or anything else that we decide to, 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 to give, in essence, what we're telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu is that we want you to use us as the vessel that, is going to, that you're going to give to this uh, person by. That's an aspect. I know you're going to give this person food or money or whatever it is, with or without me. You don't need me to run the world. You don't need anything. And anyone that has still uh, doubts or confusions about whether a Kadosh Baruch Hu needs something or not, as I said last night, another reminder, read the commentary by the Rambam on Perek Chelek, a commentary on the Mishnah. Uh, and Perek Chelek, it's uh, right before he uh, goes in there, it's a whole elaborate, well-known section that he uh, talks about how 
there is different types of heretics that think that God needs something. But the point being is, is that when a person gives, gives money for Kiruv, gives money to a Kolel, gives money for the sake of Torah, that person is in essence taking. Why are they taking? I understand Hashem is, you know, is, uh, is, uh, is going to give one way or the other. And I'm asking Hashem to use me. I'm giving. I'm, I'm going to donate a few dollars uh, to, uh, uh, for the sake of Torah. So I want to be the vessel. But how is that taking really? Because when you decide that you want to be the vessel, then in essence, what are you doing? You're taking a merit for yourself. You're guaranteeing yourself one thing. You're guaranteeing yourself that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to reward you. When you give to the right place, you give for the right cause, you, uh, and you give the right amount too, you, uh, you get a, uh, you get a, you're guaranteeing yourself a blessing. There isn't really not much that's guaranteed in the world other than, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, dying one day. Uh, some people say taxes, but I don't think that's necessarily true. So there's a lot of really wealthy people that avoid paying taxes. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a uh, uh, not much guarantee in the world of money. People that are rich today don't necessarily have a promise that they'll be rich tomorrow. They don't even have a promise that they'll be alive tomorrow. But when a person gives for the sake of Torah, they are in essence taking. They're taking themselves an a, 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 a insurance policy that they're going to have something, something when, they, uh, when Hashem looks at their account and sees do they have merits or not. So Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Ve'ikhuli truma. Now, another thing that uh, we learned from here is that uh, there is different types of givers. There are different types of givers that, uh, that exist in the world. And uh, we know that there is a, uh, uh, the giver that's called, uh, uh, that's symbolized here. Symbolized here of different types of givers. First and foremost, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I don't want everybody to give. I only want the people that are their heart motivates them to give. As he says here, uh, take for me a portion from every man whose heart motivates him. Shall you take my portions? Meaning when a person gives many times people give, but they give with conditions. I'm going to donate X amount of money. If you give me a blessing, if you put my name on the shul, if you, uh, you know, show me a lot of respect every time I see you, if you uh, stand up when I see you, if you uh, tell everybody that I gave and, and, and they, in essence, you know, they give, but they're giving as a transaction, as a business transaction. It's not really giving for the sake of giving. And that's unfortunately a very bad way to give. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, when you're giving for my Torah, when you're giving for my Mishkan, from your giving for, to be a partners with me, Give only what you have a serious motivation in your heart to give. Give only something that you're seriously, you know, you want to give this. Don't be one of these people that says, oh yeah, here's $20. Okay, if $20 is a lot of money to you, then yeah, of course, give it. But if you have tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands, or millions of dollars, and you're giving $20, don't think that this is something that's going to uh, 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 be uh, viewed as a good thing. There are many people, the uh, Chafetz Chaim says, that there are many people that will actually get punished. And this is mentioned in the, uh, by uh, his Talmid Muvak, Rav Elchanan Wasserman, in his Ikvita uh, de Meshicha, where he says that there's going to be many people that are going to get punished at the time uh, before Mashiach. And he says that the people that will be punished the most severely are the wealthy people. The wealthy people that did not give enough for the sake of Torah, Shem Ishmo. You know, talking about pe- right now, uh, you know, people have an enormous amount of money, an enormous amount of money. All types of people have made money over the last 10 or 15 years where you have people that had no concept of investing all of a sudden became, you know, billionaires. They put $10,000, $20,000 in some idea that their friend told them about and just wanted to speculate and ended up being Bitcoin. And that $10,000 could literally be worth a billion dollars right now. And you have other people that, uh, you know, got into a business at the right place at the right time and HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to bless this business and the business went from being a mom and pop shop to being a conglomerate that has offices in almost every state and they're bringing in literally millions of dollars every single month. Then you have certain people that started all types of uh, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, networks on YouTube, or on uh, uh, TikTok and Instagram and all of these social networks where they actually made a business out of it. They have subscribers, they have donors, they have all types of things. And literally people made millions and millions of dollars from all types of uh, ideas that have developed that have uh, into the world over the last decade actually especially in the last five or six years An enormous amount of money has been made by a lot of different types of people both young and old people that are, were in the uh, software and the development business some of them made a fortune by developing the, the fun foundation of something and then selling the business for 100 200 500 million dollars to a google or a facebook or one of those company where to that big company it's literally not even a reportable transaction you know they, it's it's such for them they they've they have grown so much they've become trillion dollar companies that they don't even have to report that they bought this hundred million dollar company and two three four years later when they develop it to be something significant they could pretend as if they created it out of nothing but the point is for that person that developed that idea that sold it for a hundred or two hundred million dollars or even a billion dollars that was a life changer for them and a lot of that has happened over the last several years and of course everyone knows that the market is closer to its peak than it is to its bottom and uh meaning closer to the end of the bubble than it is to the uh uh, uh to a uh, higher level but nonetheless there is a lot of people that have been given a big fortune but have not taken that to heart meaning they have not really thought about who is the one that gave all of this to me and do i owe something do I owe something because Hashem gave me this responsibility? When a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives you money, He's not giving you money because He wants you to buy 14 cars. Even if you like cars, you could only drive one at a time. He didn't buy, give you all this money so you could buy 15 houses. Even though He wants you to enjoy the world, there's no need for you to own so many houses. You can't go to more than one bathroom at a time. You can't sleep in one, one, more than one bed at a time. You're allowed to enjoy life. You're allowed to have good time. But when people make their whole life into uh, something that materialism, where it's one vacation after another, one steak after another, and they start getting to a point where they forget that anybody else in the world exists, that they actually have been given a responsibility to help those that are in need, especially those that are in need in the Torah world, whether it's the Torah institutions themselves or it's the Avrechim. And many times people don't give or they give to the wrong places or they don't give enough you know he gives he got a billion dollars and he figures that he is good because everyone gives him respect because he donated a million dollars i'm sorry to tell you you gave a million dollars you're going to get punished for it you're not going to get rewarded for that million dollars why because according to what you have you were supposed to give a whole lot more than that add another a few zeros to that that's how much you were supposed to give when you have that kind of money and that's why it's a very very confusing world where you see certain times people get so much respect for the little bit that they give because the perspective of people is that this is a lot but of course a kadosh Baruch Hu has his own calculations so what a kadosh Baruch Hu in essence is telling us here in the beginning of the parasha is that a person is going to invest in the torah make sure that your heart is what's motivating you what does it mean your heart is motivating you you're really into it you're not just writing a check and uh, thinking oh okay i just wrote this okay go go let me just you know move on with my life no i want you in it i don't need your money i want you in it i want you to be involved i want you to give because you thought about it you thought about the significance of it just like before you're going to invest and buy 10 50 100 million dollar business you're going to do all the due diligence you have to before you give that ten million dollars that one million dollars that uh, five thousand dollars make sure you do the calculations ah listen i'm going to invest here i'm going to put this money here and this is going to grow for me i have an assurance it's going to grow for me because this is going to help people do chuba this is going to help people that get involved in your spiritual investments put your heart into it but unfortunately rabotai karim kadosh Baruch Hu also tells us there are different types of givers this is the portion that you shall take from them gold silver and copper those are the first three uh uh things that a kadosh Baruch Hu says that they should give but then of course there's other things but uh, the chachamim teach us and the first time i heard this i heard this from rabbi Ephraim, that uh there are different types of givers this uh gold uh, silver and copper is is 
actually uh, symbolic of the three different types of givers. Gold is uh, in Hebrew spelled zav. Zav is zayin hey vet, and it's a acronym for zeanoten bari. That uh, this person that's a gold uh, giver. This guy is a he's the best type of giver. Why? He's healthy, everything is good, and he and he wants to give anyway. Why? Because he really put his heart into it. He cares about the cause. He cares about Torah. He cares about the future, and he gives not because he's expecting anything in return. He gives for the sake of giving. That's a golden giver. That's the best type of giver. I have a few of those people that I know, and not many. Literally, less than a handful. Less than a handful. We have. Tens of thousands, Baruch Hashem, tens of thousands of people that watch our shiurim and Baruch Hashem, thousands of them, you know, give and, and help us and, and, and uh, help us do a lot of the things that we do. But there's a, a few of them that are unique. Why are they unique? Because it's not just about that they give a significant amount of what they make, but they don't ever have to be asked. They don't even need a reminder. They simply make it part of their life that I need to give. I need to give for the sake of Torah. And it's amazing to, to, to see these people really put themselves out there and invest into the Torah because they know this is the right thing to do and they're not expecting anything in return. Of course, everyone would love to have blessings and success and so on and so forth, but the golden giver is not doing it for that. The golden giver is doing it because he knows it's Hashem gave me, that's, he gave me a responsibility. With that gift, he gave me a responsibility. So that's the golden giver. Then there's the kesef, the, the silver. Kesef is uh, silver. It also, it's also means money. That's also an acronym. That's also an acronym that uh, Kesef is an acronym where it says when he sees danger, he opens. Meaning a person had, had money all along. And he would give, you know, he'd signed up for, uh, he makes 15000 20000 50000 a month, but he signed up, you know, to give 50 bucks a month or, or something that's not really appropriate, or he doesn't give it all. But the moment he sees the, uh, the tables turn, he sees that some of investments went down. All of a sudden, his investment portfolio drops by 40% in a week. All of a sudden, he feels pain on his, uh, on his side. And the doctor says... We have to check you. This is very serious. Stop everything that you're doing. You can't go to work for a week until we get a uh, real diagnosis of why this pain. He gets a scare. And then he says, oh, Rabbi, listen, aren't you building a kolel or yeshiva or, or something? You're still working, right, Rabbi? I haven't talked to you in a while. Listen, uh, where could I wire $5,000? Oh, wow, Baruch Hashem, thank you very much. But the reality is, He's not the ideal giver. It's good that he's giving. It's good that he's getting the sign that, okay, Kadosh Baruch Hu is giving you this pain because he's trying to get your attention, but it's not ideal like the golden giver that already gave before anything happened. This guy saw some pain. As soon as he saw some pain, okay, okay, let me write a check. God, save me before he goes, gets too late. Save me before he gets too late. So this is the Kesef. The third one is Nechoshet. Nechoshet is copper. Nechoshet is a acronym, Netinat Chole Sheomer Tnu. This is an acronym for, this is the gift of the sick who says give, give already. This is a person that already got sick. He's already sick. He already lost a lot. And he's pretty much at a point where he's like, has lost hope. And he says, you know what, whatever, listen. I can't take the money with me anyway. I'm dying just, just give the rabbi $100, give the rabbi $5,000, give, give, just whatever, just give something. And meaning it's one of those hopeless, uh, last, uh, 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 you know, will and testament type of uh, gift where, uh, you know, it's like in the uh, in a uh, game of football I used to play when I was a, uh, in high school. You know, anytime you have a, a close game, but uh, you only have a few seconds left of the game, what do they typically do? They throw what's called a Hail Mary. They throw a, a ball all the way into the, in the sky, hoping that the team catches it, you know, and uh, and scores. You know, this is pretty much the, uh, the last chance. We'll give it uh, whatever we can, and whatever happens, happens. This is unfortunately typical to the uh, Nechoshet, the, the, uh, the copper giver. 
that uh, gives, but really when it's almost too late. Too late would be after you already died, but it's almost too late. Where, you know, it's a, uh, it's not, uh, to say the least, it's not a, uh, a person that's the ideal giver. And the question is, how does a person get to uh, understand, you know, what's, you know, how to be this ideal giver? First and foremost, we should always be reminded. Etz chayim ilem achazikim ba v'tomchea meushal. The etz chayim, the the tree of life, okay, uh, is is given to those that support it. Meaning that uh, that blessing is given to those people that invest in Torah, that invest into Kiruv, that invest into Hakadosh Baruch Hu uh, in, in his business, in essence. The people that want to be partners with Hashem. Those are the people that have the biggest uh, blessing in their life. Those are the people that will end up being the most praiseworthy. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give food to his creation with or without us. And when a person invests, he shows Hashem that he knows what his responsibility is in his world. On the other hand, a person needs to know that with or without you giving, it's not going to uh, change your, your income for that year. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu already decided how much income you're going to make on Rosh Hashanah. On Rosh Hashanah, you decide how much money you're going to make. From Rosh Hashanah until Rosh Hashanah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides you're going to make, let's say, $100,000. Okay, so you're going to make $100,000, almost $10,000 a month. Now, you decide, I want to give $10,000. So the Gemara says, oh, if you do, you're going to give $10,000 for the sake of Torah, that $10,000 is not included in that income. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu pays for the mitzvot. Meaning, whatever a person uses for the sake of mitzvot, whether it is donating money to feed the poor, or for the sake of Torah, or for the sake of a mitzvah, for Shabbat, for Yom Tov, and so on, that's not part of the income. That's not part of the income. In, in essence, you're putting Hashem on the spot where He has to find a way to give you an extra 10000 this year because that's what you gave. And the higher the level of the Amunah, the more a person gives the more a person gives so now when a person is the golden type of giver that type of person is already taking the uh, uh making commitments ahead of time making commitments uh, uh, ahead of time where he's already giving she's already giving before she even sees the blessing and i've seen with my own eyes i've seen with my own eyes people that do this and again like i said there's only a few that i know that have done this and I've seen the blessings, the miracles in front of my eyes of what happens. Because a certain person decided to uh, to give. Not only to give, but to give a substantial amount and to uh, give without necessarily know who, what, when, and how. And the amount of blessings this person had over the next few years, they themselves say, I'm surprised that Hashem is paying me. Is this okay? Am I getting a reward in this world? I say, listen, Hashem gives you a gift, say thank you. Why would anybody be concerned about uh, Hashem rewarding them? If a person is truly righteous and they know that Hashem is giving them a lot, they have to check, is this really uh, what I want? Is this not what I want? Arab Shpadron, Arab Shalom, he used to have uh, some very famous stories that he would give. And is a, uh, uh, one of the famous stories that he, uh, that he said, which I, the first time I heard it was from Rabbi Fai many years ago, was a story about uh, Rabbi Yonatan Aibishitz when he was very young. Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz, Allah was a uh, uh, Kodesh Kodeshim, and when he was young and just newly married in those days, when someone was already uh, recognized as a uh, true scholar, uh, all of the wealthy people, all of the wealthy Jews would want the, uh, their daughters to marry this scholar because it was an uh, honor to have somebody like that in the family. And uh, in order to entice the scholar to marry their daughter, they would promise them a uh, substantial amount of money and give them a substantial amount of money so they could continue focusing just on learning Torah and not have to worry about any money. So such was the case with Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz. They recognized him as a diamond uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's as rare as can be. And uh, one of the uh, wealthy families saw and uh, the father said, listen, I'll, you will marry my daughter. She's a good girl. You meet her. If everything works out, you guys want to marry each other. I'm going to give you 300 gold coins. Okay. Uh, 3,000. 3,000 gold coins. 3,000 uh, is a lot of money, substantial amount of money. 
and uh, of course everything else was good she was a modest tzadika everything was great and on top of it I'm going to be able to study Baruch Hashem of course the Gemara in Masechet Sotah says in the beginning of the tractate says that a person gets a, uh, a spouse based on his actions if he is righteous he gets a modest woman if he's wicked he gets a putza he gets an immodest woman so of course Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit's got a, a tzadika not only was she uh, coming from a wealthy family but she was also a very very serious tzadika which you'll see from this story so uh the um Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit's married this uh this woman this tzadika and uh continued his learning now at the time they uh they had this uh bet midrash where rabbi yonatan abishit would learn with a uh with his chavruta and his chavruta was one of these really kanaim these these zealous people that uh really fought for the truth and sometimes uh pushed the envelope a little too far especially when it came to idolatry one day these uh these uh, christians that of course tried to do everything possible to destroy Judaism in every way shape or form came into town and decided that they're going to build a church right out right next door to the synagogue like as if there's no other place on earth that they can build their place of idolatry they have to build it right across the street from the synagogue from the Bet Midrash that Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit and his and his friend are learning so of course nobody liked it but the Chavruta, Rabbi Yaakov, when he saw that he just couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand it. every day. They would see it out of the window. They would hear the bells. He says, one day I'm going to take revenge against them. Rabbi Yonatan Abishit would try to calm his friend down, but nothing, nothing really prevailed. He hated it with a passion. And really, this is one of the things that the Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara says, that you're supposed to hate idolatry. But he hated it with a passion, even more than a norm. Now, one day, he couldn't take it anymore, and he decided to take matters into his own hands, and he broke into this Chavuta, Rabbi Yaakov, decided to break into the church. Went into the church, saw their huge, disgusting idolatry across with a yoshke hanging on it their god is hanging on there like a shish kebab and he decided to start breaking it as soon as he broke it it created a big noise and he started going back you know to, to leave but there was commotion the uh pastors that were uh, living inside there ran outside to see what the commotion is saw the jew chased him caught him and beat him senseless beat him senseless and put him into one of the rooms he wasn't allowed to uh to leave until they had a uh, judgment of what to do with him the next morning when Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz came to learn Torah he saw that his chavruta wasn't there he wasn't too concerned he figured he's busy doesn't feel well okay but the second day when he saw his friend is not there he started getting concerned asked around and no one has seen him no one has seen him meanwhile the church had their meeting and decided that they're gonna burn Rabbi Yaakov alive in the middle of the market on a specific date for desecrating their idol that such was the life in those days simply the church took matters that the law into their hands and decided to decreed a death penalty on a jew imagine living in such a time Shemishmo. so rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz saw all of this that his friend is missing and started praying to hashem please help us all of a sudden there is knock on the door rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz opens he says yeah and he sees that there is a uh pastor the uh that works in the next door place can i help you he says listen your uh, friend yaakov he he's with us and if you want to see him alive i'm the only one that can help you 
because in the next couple of days, they're going to burn him alive in the middle of the market for what he did. Now, Rabbi Yonatan Ibeshit is there with a few other people in the Bet Midrash to hear this horrible news. And he says, okay, what do you want? He says, I want 3,000 gold coins, which is an enormous amount of money. Enormous amount of money. And he said, listen, get it, you have your friend. You don't get it, your friend's going to be burned. You have until tomorrow to give it to me. Because after that, I'll be too late. Of course, everybody discussed, I mean, there's a big mitzvah, uh, you know, pidyon shvuim, to say, to, to, to release a prisoner, to save a Jew's life. It's a very big deal. So everybody went, let's try to get whatever we can get. Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit thought to himself, it's a big mitzvah. It's a big mitzvah that I can do here. But the same token, it's taking all of the money that I got from my father-in-law, and, and giving it, it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know if uh, my wife is going to agree to this. Our lives are going to change. He couldn't take it. He said, I have to do it. He got went into the safe, got all of the money that they had, the whole 3,000. Went to the uh, pastor and said, here you go. He said, how'd you get the money so fast? Abiyant and Abishit told them, I had this money, I got it as a gift my father-in-law and this is all I have the pastor couldn't believe it he says that's what you would do you giving your friend everything you have he says yeah the Jew is worth a lot more the pastor was so impressed with Rabbi Yonatan he says I've never seen such integrity such real love never seen anything like this and he parted ways with him after giving him Rabbi Yaakov. And he told him, if you want him to stay alive, he has to leave the city forever, never come back. Of course, Rabbi Yaakov fled the city to save his life. And Rabbi Yonatan knew he has to go back home. Okay, he did a big mitzvah, Baruch Hashem, but he has to go back home. But he already planned ahead. He said, listen, my wife, once my wife hears this, I don't know what she's going to say, so I already tell her that I have to leave for a few days. So, I have a few days that I can pretend like I'm somewhere else, but in reality, he's going to be in the Bet Midrash. Thinking about uh, what to say, how to say it, maybe Hashem will open up his mind and give him something good to say to give her the uh, a way to justify it. And while he's in the Bet Midrash, his friends come, and they say, we, have a, uh, we, got, uh, we got some money. We got some money. He said, oh, okay, but you don't need to. You can keep it for yourself. Well, what do you mean? I already gave it to them. And he told them the whole story. I gave everything he had. He said, oh, okay, great that you did it, but we want the mitzvah also. We worked hard to go get money from people. We want the mitzvah also. So at least let us buy half the, half the uh, mitzvah. We'll give you 1500 You'll get half. We get half. Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit says to them, you think I'm going to sell my mitzvah? You think I'm going to sell my mitzvah? I can't sell my mitzvah. It's my mitzvah. I need my mitzvah. It's my mitzvah. I can't. No, no amount of money in the world is worth this mitzvah. I just got a mitzvah to save a Jewish life. You want me to sell that mitzvah? I can't sell a mitzvah. After back and forth, back and forth, it was decided, that, no, no selling. He's not selling the mitzvah. Rabbi Yonatan was still a young man, a genius, a tzaddik, and very zealous about keeping his mitzvah. So, a few days passed, and one day, the pastor comes to the house of Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz. Of course, Rabbi Yonatan is not there, and uh, he tells the, uh, his wife, he's like, listen, I have to give you something. Me? Something? Who are you? Oh, I'm the pastor of this. Okay, why? What do you want? He gives up a whole boatload of money, everything he has. He says, what, what, do you, what do you want me to do with this? He says, listen, the church that I'm part of, they're on to me that I'm the one that freed your husband's friend. And I overheard them talking that they're going to kill me. So I have to run. But I can't carry this with me, all this money that I collected over the years. And the only person in the world that I can trust is your husband. She says, what do you know about my husband? 
He says, your husband is the most honest, sincere, loving person I have ever met. He gave all of his money, all of your money, to save his friend. All 3,000 gold coins he gave. And that's part of it also. And all of the money that I collected. Over the years, all of it is here. And I know that your husband is such an honest and good person that if I am able to survive this and I come back, I know he's going to give it back to me. But if I die, it's all yours. She says, okay. So he fleed. Several hours later, people found his body under the, under the uh, bridge. They caught him. They killed him. The, uh, the Christians killed him. And uh, his wife, the Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit's wife, realizes how much of a tzaddik her husband is and how HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewarded him. Later that day, Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit comes home and he has been trying to figure out what is he going to say to his wife to convince her not to divorce him, to convince her that he's not crazy, to convince her that it was really the right thing to do. And he gets into the house expecting that by now she probably realizes that all of the money is gone. And he comes in and he sees his wife happy, playing with all types of jewelry. And she goes, hey, my tzaddik husband, I'm so proud of you. Abiyonatan is looking, what? Me? You're proud of me? She goes, you're such a tzaddik. I'm a tzaddik. She goes, yeah, you're the biggest tzaddik in the world, she says. I know what you did. I know that you gave all of what we have to save a Jew, to save your chavruta. And I agree with you, you did the right thing. And not only that, a kadosh Baruch Hu agrees with you and look at what he gave you. And she tells him the whole story of what happened with the pastor and how he gave her and then he, his body was found and he died. He got murdered by the Christians. Abiyonatan Ibishitz looks at all this money and starts crying hysterically. He starts crying uncontrollably and his wife doesn't understand why is her husband crying. Why is he crying? Why are you crying? Yonatan says, Akadosh Baruch Hu rejected my mitzvah, he rejected my tzedakah, he doesn't want it, because he gave it back to me, threw it in my face, whatever reward I was supposed to get. You don't get reward in this world, you get reward in the next world. Akadosh Baruch Hu gave me everything that I gave, plus a lot more in my face in this world, which means he doesn't want my mitzvah. And he cried hysterically until he fell asleep. And that night, that night he got a message in a dream that he was right. HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not happy with him. He said, you did good by giving, but you were supposed to share that mitzvah. Other people need to also give. You can't just take the entire mitzvah to yourself. That's why everything was given back to him. Now, Rabbi Karim, this is the reason why Rabbi Kadosh, Rabbi Udanasi, he was extraordinarily wealthy, had hundreds of horses and properties, and was like a king from the Rabban Gamliel family, one of the descendants of David Melech. He was extraordinarily wealthy, but yet he would ask his rich friends to give tzedakah, not because he needed their help, because he knew they needed it. They need the merits. They need the merits. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us that whatever motivates us, whatever motivates us to give tzedakah should be the right motivation. It should not be something because we're expecting to get something in return in this world, because we want a certain amount of respect, because we want this, because we want that, simply because we want want Hashem to use us as a vessel to spread His word in the world. That's what we want. The parasha continues. Parasha continues talking about the Mishkan, talking about all of the extraordinary things that Akadosh Baruch Hu put in this Mishkan, and we see that Akadosh Baruch Hu does certain things at certain times that we can learn from. For example, the uh, when he tells us the details of how 
this mishkan was made and all the material that was made we see that the uh the cover for the mishkan was made from the skin of a tachash tachash was a uh, deer-like bull-like am- animal it was a combination of the two it was a decent you know very big animal but it was an extraordinarily beautiful animal the most beautiful animal that existed and it was their its skin was like a rainbow something out of this world perhaps that's where the uh uh the uh, the the people got uh, their uh you know their stories of the unicorn something similar to that but it didn't have wings obviously either way this tachash was an extraordinarily beautiful animal and the uh, Chachamim ask, was this animal always there? Why is it mentioned here? Who, what, when? Rashi says this was a creation for its time, meaning that this Tachash was not created in Genesis. This was one of the later creations. There was a few creations that Akadosh Baruch Hu made after the original creation, because generally speaking, everything else was created in, in Bereshit, in the beginning of the world this animal was created at mount sinai and existed at that time when its skin was needed for the sake of the mishkan the bet mikdash but as soon as there was no longer a need for it that's it it became extinct and there was no because there's no reason for it but this again is a uh, uh symbolic for us to sh- to see and understand clearly how a kadosh Baruch Hu manages his world where he shows us clearly that he has no limitation he plays with this world very similar to how when uh, our kids play putty he can do whatever he wants as the pasuk says Ayad Hashem tiktsar, is, is Hashem's hand short is there anything that Hashem can't do this is important for each and every one of us to know when we are giving when we are doing because many times people are concerned that if I'm going to give this and this much then I'm not going to have if I do this much then I'm not gonna this this is a mistake when you make Torah your priority in life and you say listen no matter what I'm gonna learn my hour or two in the morning I'm gonna learn my hour or two or more at night which if that means I'm gonna have to work less then let it mean I'm gonna work less why because if when I work for Hashem when I serve Hashem and I learn Torah I know for sure that although it may not be easy although there is going to be some test i know that this is certainly the right decision this is certainly the right decision and i will not lose as a result of it hashem is not going to punish me for learning torah same concept when a person decides to make a uh, commitment to donate at least 10 to 20 percent of their income for the sake of torah every time they get a check they donate why because a person naturally in their rational mind will think wait if i'm going to give this uh this money then that means that uh i'm you know i have to live off of 90 percent. i have to live off of 80 percent, and 80 percent is not always enough maybe my business is going to go down maybe my competition will this maybe that maybe this don't ask any of those questions when it comes to hashem don't ask any of those don't do calculations with akadosh Baruch Hu. why ayad hashem tiktah is hashem not capable of doing something there's no such thing as getting punished for doing the right thing for you know according to hashem so when a person makes that commitment makes that leap of faith jumps into the water like Nachshon ben Aminada he jumps into the water sacrifices himself she sacrifices herself for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there's no doubt that that you know that that person will end up on top at some point may not happen right away may not happen for some time only HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows the calculations but for sure you will benefit and see that that was the right decision and many times when people have the ability to do good that yetzara comes to them and reminds them of how bad it used to be or how bad it can be and maybe you shouldn't do and all types of calculations get involved and they end up either not doing as much or not doing at all and this unfortunately is a uh, is, is a mistake that's made often uh and uh many times people will end up donating to the wrong entity just because of a tax benefit let's say or because of a social benefit where they know that this torah institution is the best one it's the one that helped them it's the one that saved them it's the one that did everything but they're gonna donate to somewhere else because it's uh 
uh, perhaps it's more famous or perhaps it's a uh, local so therefore there's tax benefits and so on so a person can make such a judgment like that and think oh but I'm still giving it the to Torah it's still a good thing wrong it's not just about giving it to an institution it's about giving it to the right one it's not just about giving it's about making sure you have a kadosh Hu as the reason why you're giving and not the uh, uh your own personal benefits if you end up getting certain benefits whether it be taxes or or social or whatever other benefits that you're getting as a result of it no problem it's not a sin to get benefits but when a person makes their giving a uh, uh something that they're already uh, expecting to receive from it something material then it's not really giving it's more like business it's more like business so Kadosh Baruch Hu says if I want to make a new creation just for you then I'll make a new creation just for you if I didn't make a new creation just for you that means I don't want to make a new creation just for you if I want to make a miracle then I'll make a miracle if I don't want to make a miracle I won't make a miracle don't ask me to make a miracle focus on what you're supposed to do and HaKadosh Baruch Hu will decide what's best for you and that's one of the things that we have to remind ourselves on a regular basis because many times we feel like we can do more if Hashem gave us more but the truth be told is that this is somewhat of a heretical thought why is it some of a heretical thought because if Hashem knew that you can do more with more wouldn't he already give you more meaning that if he's not giving you more that's because he wants what you have now he wants you to learn as much as you can now based on your schedule now he wants you to do as much as you can based on what you can do now not based on oh if you have uh different circumstances and that's what happens a lot of times is that people live in illusion where they say listen it's okay for me to do almost nothing because I'm waiting for Hashem to open the gates for me and then I'll do a lot I'll give a lot once I have a lot but now that I don't have a lot I'm not going to give anything it's a mistake it's a mistake a kadosh Baruch Hu wants our heart what does it mean he wants our heart he wants us to do the best we possibly can with whatever we can and he will decide if he wants to change the circumstances for us or not and this of course is relevant to our learning Torah it's relevant to how we manage our marriage how we respect our spouses how we raise our kids how we give staka where do we give staka all of these different things have a connection and of course we can continue going on into every single page in this parasha but I see that we've already gone to a point where it's almost an hour uh, and uh, I uh, I know that you guys have uh, some questions so perhaps we could already start with the questions and uh, and then after I get a drink and then uh, we'll go from there one second Okay, Baruch. In the Gemara Masechet Brachot, page sixty-one, a talks about the side which the woman was made. What does it mean? The tail was removed from Adam. What does it mean? Okay, so if you look there in the uh, commentary, it says that uh, there's a couple of opinions. There's a couple of opinions of how Adam Alishon was created, and also Chava. Uh, in fact, the Zohar Kadosh elaborates that there was more than one Chava there was more than one uh, Eve the first Eve that was created um, left Adam Rishon she did not want to be Ezer Kenegdo she did not want to be uh, a uh, his his help and uh, she left him and she ended up marrying the Satan and she became the Satan's wife that uh, Shemi Shmo that is responsible for all of the immorality in the world and uh, when Orachayim HaKadosh uh, spoke about the issue he says that he had a uh, dream where he had to fight the satan and he beat him and he had to fight the uh, his wife and he almost lost to her in essence that she is stronger than the satan himself uh, so uh, some of the uh, Chachamim speak about the fact that there is more than one Eve more than one Chava uh, the second thing is is that how she was created and so on the Gemara talks about how uh, some of the opinions are that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created where it says in the, in the original verse it says man and woman were created uh, but then later on it, it says it uh, differently uh, so uh, the Chachamim say that uh, initially that Adam and Chava were uh, uh, 
co- connected back to back. We're connected back to back. So uh, Adam was on this side, Chava was on that side, and they were like Siamese twins. But of course, uh, different, and Akadosh Bahu split them. Why did Akadosh Bahu uh, create uh, 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 Adam Rishon uh, alone and not create both of them at the same time? Because in essence, she came out from him. Why did he create them at the same time? Because if they were created at the same time, they would uh, not uh, agree of who the world was created for and uh, who is in charge and so on. And the woman would never want to submit to a husband. So it would be a nightmare. So HaKadosh Baruch had to create her, uh, had to create her uh, uh, second. And that's also the reason why uh, he didn't create the woman first. Because if the woman would be created first, she would never want to submit to a husband. Uh, and this is part of the purpose of our creation as part of being modest is for women to submit to our husband. Uh, of course, assuming the husband is a reasonable, normal person. Uh, so part of the opinion is that there was a uh, connection. They were physically connected uh, and uh, back to back. And in essence, the, the part uh, where the, uh, 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 the tailbone is, there is a tailbone, there's no tail, but where the tailbone is, is in essence where that separation was uh, was made. Uh, so that's uh, in essence what the Gemara is talking about over there. Chaim is asking, how is it that Meaningful Minute and other channels support Ephraim Goldberg despite clearly lying? For example, he blatantly saying that he would never invite a missionary even though he do- he's done it on a regular basis over the years. Even Aldestein uh, is caught lying and has gone against the holy rabbis for years. Um, well, the guys from Meaningful Minute, they're not Tommy de uh, They're uh, just a couple of young guys uh, that, uh, you know, want to take advantage of the social media demand uh, for uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, programs and, and rabbis and personalities and so on. So in essence, they're... People that are trying to make, you know, make, make, uh, give themselves a, uh, uh, a name, uh, like, uh, unfortunately, a Tower of Babel. So they're not necessarily working off of a uh, uh, Da Torah as far as their decisions and so on. To my knowledge, Ephraim Goldberg is uh, uh, the rabbi of at least one of them. I think the kid Nachi. I think he's actually his rabbi. So, of course, he's going to support him. If he's his rabbi, he's his hero. He's going to believe every little bit of nonsense that uh, Ephraim tells him. So when Ephraim tells the world, oh, yeah, they, uh, they threatened me. Uh, they, uh, you know, the FBI is investigating it. And that person should, uh, you know, uh, is going to get caught. And uh, they should, uh, you know, turn themselves in because we're going to catch you with that ugly smirk that he has. Like, you really are going to be happy putting people in jail? I mean, I, I, it's uh, you know kind of strange. I mean, don't get me wrong. I agree that whoever, uh, if somebody actually did threaten him and uh, crossed that line, and I think somebody called his nine-year-old daughter, according to him, uh, and threatened her, if somebody actually did that, then they really should be instituted. I mean, that's crossing the line. There's no reason for anybody to uh, take the law into their hands and... Uh, uh, threaten anybody's life, uh, uh, whether it's Ephraim or it's his nine-year-old daughter. I highly, uh, you know, doubt this actually happened. Uh, I highly doubt it happened. But if it happened, uh, then again, it's a, uh, it's, it's sad. It shouldn't have been done. Surely, it's not coming from anyone that's considered uh, uh, a a normal person, uh, and especially not somebody that's actually learning our shulim. Uh, perhaps it's somebody that's watched our shulim, but it's not somebody that's learning them, which are two different things. Because anyone that's learning them is going to know that uh, we do not uh, recommend violence under any condition. Even if we say death penalty a million and a half times in every shul, everyone understands that I always say, this is not in real, you know, for you to exercise. This is, we don't have a sanedrin. But anyway, some people take matters into their own hands. And perhaps they did threaten him. I don't believe they did personally because I already know that he's a compulsive liar. So it's it's impossible for me to believe anything he says. Uh, but if, if somebody did it, then of course it's a uh, it's a sad scenario that people have uh, have have done such a thing. 
But I still uh, would not, uh, uh, you know, say, oh, they're going to get caught and they're going to get uh, prosecuted and, and be like celebrating it. I mean, it's a, there's actually a, uh, a, a, a teachings in the Gemara and, a, a, and a, it's, it's even in the Mishnah. Someone that takes honor in the downfall of his friends has no share of the world to come. So I'm not exactly sure where Ephraim is getting off on uh, uh, being, uh, uh, you know, excited to go catch somebody and put him in jail forever. I mean, that's completely stupid. I know that he sent people to my uh, to my house and he thinks that I'm the one that did something. But of course, I know what I did and I know what I don't do. And uh uh, I don't have any uh, any concerns whatsoever, uh, and that's why when the uh, when the police that he sent to my house, the investigators that he sent to my house, when they came here, within 30 seconds they knew the whole thing is nonsense, and I invited them into the house, telling them, listen, if you want, you can take the computer, you can take the phone, just give me something to use in the meantime, while you guys investigate all the files if you want. They already knew within, uh, they said, no, 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 we don't need to do anything, this is, we're sorry, we just have to come here. Like they apologized for coming to my house. But of course, it was scary for my little kids to see there's police, there's guns, and why, why are they here and so on. So of course, Ephraim doesn't care about that. And he doesn't tell that part of the story to his audience. So when he tells the little Nachi that's looking for 15 minutes of fame, oh yeah, they called my nine-year-old daughter, they threatened us. Oh, that's disgusting. So he, in essence, what does he do? He makes himself into a victim. He makes himself into a victim because he knows he has no halacha to back him. He has no gdoladol to back him. He has no talmit chacham to back him. Nobody will back him. The only people that he says are backing him are either the missionaries or the reform rabbis that he's friends with. No actual real chacham is ever going to back this person. So he has to get Nachi to, uh, to uh, join him on his, uh, on his uh, seek for, uh, uh, for uh, public sympathy. So it's pathetic, it's sad, but it's not a new thing. En chadash tachat is. This is nothing new under the sun. It's nothing new under the sun. And also as a side note for all of you guys that uh, still are, uh, are bent on this whole letter by Rabbi Shechtel, uh, and, and, and people think that Rabbi Shechtel, because he didn't uh, say no, therefore that means yes, because his sons went to, the, uh, to join Ephraim Goldberg. This does not, you cannot... Uh, make those types of conclusions. The Gemara in Yerushalmi, Masechet Pe'ah, says we don't make any conclusions on what the Rav actually says based on what his wife is doing. There's no such thing. We don't paskin that way. We don't uh, conclude things that way. Don't rationalize things because that's what Ephraim wants the world to do. Because he wants the world to say, look, I'm hugging these two guys. One looks like a yeshiva t- uh, rabbi. The other guy looks like a, uh, uh, I don't know, a movie star. Like, but they're both uh, related and they're both the sons of Rabbi Shechtel. So if they came to my uh, missionary show, that means it's kosher. First and foremost, you should know. That does not mean anything. Does not mean anything. Second of all, Rabbi Shechtel did not make a public uh, a, uh, uh, statement on this particular event because it was not necessary since the halacha of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and Shuchan Aruch, the Rambam, is all well known. And he himself wrote an article nine years ago for anybody that wants to read it. It's available online for free. So he doesn't need to make a public statement. That's number one. Number two, you cannot conclude uh, a, uh, uh, anything based on people that are not valid to be witnesses, not valid to, to, to take anything from. And unfortunately, if anybody spent some time looking at least into the background or the Facebook page of the two sons, one of them, you're going to be, uh, I don't know, not exactly so impressed by his lifestyle choices when he's hugging homosexuals and uh, pedophiles and all types of uh, disgusting people for a living. So, you know, for, for everybody that's jumping on the bandwagon of saying, oh, because they came to the event, that means that Rabbi Shechte, their father, that dedicated his entire life to Torah, that means that he agrees with everything. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. They're adults. They have their own free choice. One of them decides that he's going to work uh, and, and, and be, I think, a rabbi or, or, or something. Uh, and the other one decides that he wants to hang out and rub shoulders with pedophiles and Hollywood stars that are the filth of the, of, 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 of the sewer. is cleaner than them. That's what they publicize themselves. It's not Lashon Ra. It's public knowledge on their Facebook page. So if that's what Ephraim wants to use 
as is uh, 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 as is evidence for for his actions being correct. He wants to use the uh, the, uh, the the guy these two, and he wants to use uh, Nachi that's looking for a stage uh, that doesn't know anything. That somebody asked him recently to join a Gemara program, a Daf Yomi program. Him and his buddy that they do the show. Why don't you come join a Daf Yomi program? You're actually interviewing somebody that gives a Daf Yomi shiul that's very famous, very good shiul, very uh, well respected chacham. Why don't you come learn for Daf Yomi? It's 45 minutes. Oh, I don't know if I can handle it. You can't handle 45 minutes? 45 minutes of learning Torah you can't handle and you call yourself a Jew? And you're interviewing rabbis? This is the Talmudim of Ephraim Goldberg. They cannot handle 45 minutes. And again, you're not going to say these guys are Baalei Tshuva. They don't know what right or left is. These are guys that grew up in the yeshivot of, uh, of the modern Orthodox world. Meaning that for them to learn 45 minutes of Torah in the morning, it's the, it should be the, the, the minimum of the minimum. But again, it's a the world that's looking for the uh, uh, the wicked to be right. They'll find a way for them to be right. The people that are looking for the truth will find the truth. So again, I don't have anything particularly against these two young kids that run this meaningful minute and and the other one. Uh, but I don't think that their opinion is uh, is something that anyone should consider. Uh, their opinion is not valid. They're not Tommy de Chachamim. They don't have Da Torah. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't, I'm not even sure if they learn Torah at all. Uh, I, would, I would not be surprised if uh, some of my uh, six, seven year old kids that watch my Shurim know more than them. I would not be surprised. And I'm not, I'm not saying this as an insult. I'm saying this because unfortunately that's the reality. I'm saying this that's because of the reality. So again, it's a, uh, you have to understand, just because somebody has a YouTube page or some type of Instagram following does not make their opinion valid. Not in the Torah world of war. Maybe in Hollywood, maybe if somebody has a million followers, all of a sudden they become a guru. But in the Torah world, unless you have Da Torah, your opinion is meaningless. Meaningless. So, of course, Ephraim, will take advantage of the people that don't know such things. And they think that because, you know, these people show up to his show, other people put him on the channel, that means that he's doing the right thing. And with a few dollars to, uh, to pay Yeshiva, Yeshiva News or Yeshiva, whatever that website is called, to advertise his, uh, his uh, little video so you can make some fake views as if people care about what he says and why he said it. You know, so you make some fake views as if there's going to be a few thousand views, people that care about what he says. You know, so, of course, he's going to say whatever he's going to say. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised by any of it. Why? Because, again, when you have nothing to, to, to stand on, you're going to grab for whatever straw you can can. And if his, his da Torah is, is, is going to have the support of somebody that supports a, a known heretic like Slifkin, and I'm referring to Adelstein, uh, who supported Slifkin and uh, does a lot of things that are uh, 100% against Allah, like we showed in yesterday's video, or he's going to get support from a couple of kids that can't even commit 45 minutes to learn Torah, or he's going to uh, 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 get the, uh, you know support from some guy that rubs elbows with pedophiles and rapists, if that's what people want, then they deserve what they're getting. If people believe him because that, because of those, those examples, they deserve for him to be their teacher. If people want bad stuff, they deserve bad. Kadosh Baruch Hu will help them get bad. But again, a person needs to be a little clever. Be a little clever and realize that, you know, you, you can't, just because somebody says something on a video, doesn't mean anything. You have to check. How do I know all this stuff? It's part of my work to know who my enemies are. It's part of my work to know who Amisad's enemies are. So I have to know all these things. But it's, a, uh, it's, it's important for people that uh, are, uh, are, are investigating all of this stuff and questioning all of this stuff not to fall in love with, the, uh, with, the, with, with hating the people themselves or with a uh, uh, you know with uh, get, taking matters to their own hands and threatening people, it's important that people don't do stuff like that, because with 
all of the stuff that happened, the key is to understand is that their actions, what they're doing is what we hate. What they're doing is what we hate. The fact that they are bringing uh, danger to Am Yisrael is what we hate, is what we, we, uh, we speak against. Their personal uh, 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 lives, their uh, preference of what they eat, their background, their choice of, uh, of uh, I don't know, book to read. I care less about all those things. What we care about is their actions. If their actions are good, Baruch Hashem. If their actions are bad and they're putting other people at risk, then we have to speak against it. But again, it's important for people not to take stuff to their uh, to to a different level and start obsessing over the people themselves and and, and start getting crazy. Why? Because that is a definitely a tool that uh, they are using and will continue to use to uh, to you know I guess discredit the entire uh, argument against them. They justify their misbehavior through the misbehavior of other people. You know, it's as if uh, their, their logic is two wrongs make a right. Two wrongs make them right. If somebody else, they're wrong and somebody else is wrong, therefore they're right by default. That's according to the logic of the wicked people. So don't give them a reason. They already make enough mistakes on their own without anybody helping them. You don't need to uh you don't need to help them make any mistakes they already make enough mistakes on their own and uh who sees everything and eventually if they do not do tshuva will uproot them from the world in the most public fashion you will ever see where everyone will know this is the reason why they were uprooted this is the reason this is just a matter of time it's not a uh it's not a curse it's a reality it's simply a reality. We don't want them to die. Ephraim Goldberg has kids, has a wife. I want him to live to 120. Nachi has a wife. Uh, his partner has a wife. Uh, Adelstein has kids and grandkids. I want them all to live to a million years old and be righteous and go to Gan Eden. I would love to be uh, a, one of their little Hasidim if they're so righteous. The reality, it's not the case. It's not the case right now. Right now, they're on the bad side. If they do tshuva, I'll be the first one to be their biggest fan. If they do tshuva, I will be the first one to make a video celebrating their name of how great they are that they got to that such a level that they did tshuva and literally changed their entire lives and their mentality to go to the righteous side. I'll be the first one to celebrate it. I don't want people to die. I don't want people to go to Gainom. I don't want people to be uh, in, in jeopardy. We're not looking for anyone to die. We are looking for people to do tshuva. Even if that means that it's the very same per- person that uh, we spoke against. I think anybody that's been watching my shooting for long enough knows that that's the whole goal of everything. I spoke against a, uh, the uh, uh, young kid when he said something that was a mistake in one of his videos. And then a couple of months later, I put my life on the line, literally my life on the line to get him out of prison from Nigeria. Nobody in the world knows, even him, what we did in order to, to, to get him out of that prison in Nigeria. I'll put it that way nobody knows what we had to do and what we did just to get him out of there he doesn't even know himself even though i saw him after that he doesn't even know himself what we had to do and what we did in order to get him there he may not even know that i was involved he may think that i just made a couple of videos and uh you know to say oh please uh help uh help a lot of stuff went on behind those scenes that only akadosh baruchu and two other people know that's it that's it my wife and all the fine nobody else knows so trust me when i tell you i'm not looking for anybody to die i don't want anyone to die i want people to do tshuva but if they don't want to do tshuva let a kadosh b'chu uproot them why that's the reality that is the reality it's better for them to be uprooted if they don't want to do tshuva it's better for them and this is how the chachamim right and there's farim this is how the Chachamim write in their Sfarim time and time again. We have some of the, some of the Chachamim that literally were like uh, the most sensitive to, to, to people in the world. Most sensitive people in the world. But they, uh, they, they see something and say, oh, if they don't do Shiva, it's better that there's some type of takala, some type of accident happens and this person just is eliminated from the world. That would be great for them. Literally, that's what they write in their Sfarim. 
So it's not, it's not uh, that you want them to die because that's going to give you some type of pleasure. It's sad. They have kids, they have wives, they have, uh, they, have, they have a life, they have people, and so on. So again, don't focus on the people and their personalities, actions, actions, the actions themselves. All of them are making very, very serious mistakes. Trust me when I tell you, they're going to regret it if they don't do tshuva. A lot more than you hate it. A lot more than I hate it. They're going to regret it if they don't do tshuva. But it's important for people to know that the goal is to help everyone do tshuva. That's the goal. It's never to be a, a, a winner of the argument, to look good, to make money, to be more popular. None of that stuff matters to me. None of that stuff should matter to you. The only thing that should matter is to help people do tshuva. Even if that means that we're going to get a newswire, Manus Friedman decides to do tshuva and regrets every single lecture he's done over the last X amount of years and deletes them from YouTube. Issues a public apology to Klal Israel and says, do not believe anything that I said. From now on, I'm going to follow Da Torah. Guess what? I will be the first one that says Manus Friedman is a tzaddik. He's a gdolador. He's a amazing. He's the great. Why? He did tshuva. But until then, he's a rasha merusha. That's an apikos that goes against the Torah that says to people that HaKadosh Baruch needs us. But until then, if he does tshuva, psh, amazing. Same thing with Ephraim, same thing with everybody else. Currently, we have to hate them. But not hate them personally, hate their actions. We want them to do tshuva. Is it possible for them to do tshuva? Only HaKadosh Baruch knows. According to the Rambam, it's almost impossible. Once a person becomes a machti rabim, it's almost impossible. But almost impossible means... Not literally almost impossible, it just means it's really difficult. They literally have to develop a anava, a, a, a humility, uh, like a Moshe Rabenu in order to do public tshuva. Because they have to do, just like their sins were public, their tshuva has to be public. So it's very difficult. So it's, uh, they can do it. Or else the Kadosh Baruch Hu would not allow them to live. But if they don't want to do tshuva, Shem Yishmo, what can I tell you? But we do not want people to die. Let's not ever make this mistake. I've said this once, twice, several times in the past. And I'm saying it again. We want people to do tshuva. Don't go hunting for heretics. Trust me, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to know about a heretic, he'll come to you by himself. Try to help people. Not to call them out and say, oh, he's a heretic, he's this, he's that. Try to help him if you can. But if you see this person is unhelpable, he's not at a stage in his life, to be helped he doesn't want to be helped he rejects all truth then you have to run away from him. you have to kick him out you have to uh, do whatever you can if, if he's a public speaker of some kind or a public influence you have to protest against them you have to uh speak against them but it's nothing uh to for, for for the sake of uplifting yourself or for any type of benefit whatsoever there is you know other than doing the will of hashem there's no benefit in doing any of this stuff. People think that, oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, nothing great about it. It's sad. It's sad to know that there's going to be countless people that are going to go to Gainom without coming out. Trust me when I tell you it's sad. If you knew 5% of what I know about what happens after this life, you would cry for these people. Not because you have mercy for them now. You're not allowed to have mercy for them now. You have mercy for them, what's going to happen to them when they can't help themselves when they leave this world. And now HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to punish them to no end. To no end. The Holocaust becomes like a kindergarten game next to what's going to happen to these people if they don't do tshuva. Trust me when I tell you, when I think about this stuff, I cry. Because nothing can help them once they leave this world. Nothing, nothing, no Kaddish. Nothing, nothing can help them. Nothing. They can build five yeshivot in their name, it won't help them. Nothing can help them. If they leave this world this way, nothing can help them. And you have no idea what's going to happen to these people and their supporters. The people that donated money and resources to Ephraim or to Manis or to Meza or any of these Reshaim. You have no idea what HaKadosh Baruch is going to do to them if they leave this world this way. You have no idea. People have no concept of what happens after this life. No concept of, of anything. People are clueless. They think we live in, in, in some IOU where HaKadosh Baruch Hu owes us stuff. 
People have no idea. I nothing, no clue whatsoever what happens after this world. And trust me when I tell you, you will not want, even if you end up going to Gan Eden, you will not want to know that there's people in Gehenom once you know what's in it. You have no idea what happens in those places. No idea. There is no reason in the world for anyone to, to be happy that someone is a wicked person. We have to know that these people are also HaKadosh Baruch Hu's kids and we want them to do tshuva. But we cannot, under any condition, accept their current behavior as acceptable. We have to protest for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name and honor. We have to speak against them. We have to do everything possible that's allowed according to Allah to discredit them in every single way. You're even allowed to say Lashon Ara about people like this. You're even allowed to make up stuff if you want. If it's going to help people stay away from them. But doesn't mean that we want them to die this way. These are HaKadosh Baruch Hu's babies. But at the same token, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has laws for himself. That although they are his children, once they've forsaken him, once they went against him, he's obligated to punish them. Just like a mother that has kids that she put her whole life on a line to graze them. And those kids one day just decide, we don't want to play with you. We don't want to listen to you. We don't want to love you. And that mother, her heart is broken into 50 million pieces. But at the same token, she knows that if she allows them to continue behaving this way, those kids will become little Hitlers. Those kids will become a disaster and not only a pain for her, but a pain for society. And therefore, she is forced to punish those kids in order to have them behave better. Does she enjoy punishing them? No, she hates it. She suffers more than them, but she has to do it. The same thing happens with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Le'avdil, Melech Elef Avdalot. He has to punish his kids. Why? For the sake of the Torah itself and for the sake of his, of his righteous people. And if that means he has to punish his kids that went against them, that caused other people to go against them, in the highest level of punishment, to the point of complete annihilation after the ultimate suffering to destroy their neshama, things that you have no concept what they mean, Kadosh Baruch Hu still doesn't and has to do it in order to maintain the honor of his Torah, his name, and of course his other children that sacrificed their lives to upkeep both. We do not want anyone to be on the bad side. We want everyone to be on the good side. But that's not a reality. A reality is that there's going to be some people on the bad side. We hope they do tshuva. Sayyid is asking, the Gentiles who are related by patrilineal heritage to Bnei Israel learn the entire Torah, including the oral Torah and the Midrashim and the Zohar and the Kabbalah concepts, etc. during the months in the womb. If a person is halachically Jewish, meaning if his mother is Jewish, even if she's secular, if his mother is Jewish, then in the uh, while she is carrying him in her belly, he's learning the entire Torah. But again, that does not mean that uh, he will be righteous. That does not mean that he's going to follow it because he also has his own tikkun. There's a reason of why he or she is coming into the world. Everyone learns the Torah because this is, in essence, part of the things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts into a person in order for them to be able to do tshuva, in order for them to be able to serve Him. Uh, because if it was solely up to us to learn Torah from zero, we would not be able to do it. We would not be able to succeed. So in essence, when we learn Torah, we're being reminded of what we already know. So when a person a, uh, 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 learns Torah, it's good and it's in essence a reminder, but because they have a certain klipa 
due to their own misbehavior in the previous carnation they'll have a uh, certain limitations that they'll have to break meaning they'll have to do certain things take certain actions uh, in order to overcome certain barriers that uh, they're the very same neshama that learned Torah has uh you know before it allows certain to, certain things to enter it so there is a uh you know there's uh, a benefit of course for a person to be born uh, uh jewish uh because he has that torah in them but uh it's not uh free lunch uh, same thing with uh people that uh you know are born not jewish uh there is a uh, a great benefit for them to uh uh, to convert of course but it's not easy uh, but people say oh yeah but isn't it, it's much easier for the Jew uh, to do tshuva than it is for the convert to convert not necessarily true it's not necessarily true for some yes for some no some people they discover the truth and they take it with both arms and both legs and run with it for the rest of their life on a both on the Jewish side and on the Gentile side and some people see the truth clear as they and stay wicked both on the Jewish side and the non-Jewish side Hashem so it's a uh, being uh, being a Jew uh, is uh, of course there is certain benefits to it but there's also benefits in being a non-Jew that converts because you have certain uh, merits that uh, and certain things that a Jew can never get you know for a Jew that uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu is their father the uh, the uh, the convert the Hashem is their father and their mother which gives them special protection from certain enemies and so on and so forth but again it's a I, I don't think people need to focus so much about where they uh, started and where they were I think it's really more important to focus on what we're doing today what are you doing today and uh, uh, that uh, is the only thing that could help tomorrow uh, next question Nikolai is asking Resla Key says learning Torah prevents the world from tov avo, from destruction Rabbi Yochanan says oh wait I just lost your question what happened to your question sorry ah uh, Rabbi Yochanan says learning Torah builds the world it's Masech Shabbat okay is it an argument which one does what uh, it's not necessarily an argument it does both it does both a uh, the uh, the Torah there's a verse that uh, is used for it uh, eliminates destruction where it says im lo briti yomam valayla chukot shamayim va'aretz lo samti that uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu says to the Prophet if not for people learning Torah uh, the rules that uh, I use to run the world will cease to exist meaning there's not going to be gravity there's not going to be air there's not going to be any uh, all of the physical uh, and the metaphysical all of the different things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu uses the tools that he uses to run the world will cease to exist which in essence would mean that the uh, the atoms will stop spinning uh, the atoms that make up everything and uh, once they stop spinning the world will simply disappear it's not that it'll be uh it'll explode or it'll just simply disappear as if it never existed so in order for the world to exist in order for the atom to continue spinning there has to be people learning to there has to be somebody learning to lie in the world so therefore that uh, person that's learning to lie is a uh uh if you know he, he has to assume perhaps i'm the only person in the world that's learning to lie and therefore keeping the world from disaster in fact, Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin uh, believed this 100% and he built his yeshiva in such a fashion where he had multiple shifts of people uh, learning to in his yeshiva in order to make sure that there's somebody learning in his yeshiva 24 hours a day. There was always somebody learning. So people will come for the uh, one shift, there was another. Like uh, uh, companies today, Le'avdil, that uh, operate 24 hours a day. You know, they have different shifts. That's how Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin operated as yeshiva why because he took this verse to heart and he knew that it's a reality there is possible that there's nobody else in the world to study Torah and it's not like a Kadosh Baruch who says oh if they don't study Torah for a few days or for a few hours or for a few months then I'll destroy the world no he says if there's a second a single second where a uh, um people don't learn Torah 
then the uh the rules of the world will cease to exist the world will simply disappear on the other hand one of the things you could look at for Rabbi Yochanan that supports Rabbi Yochanan's argument he says the Torah builds the world is first and foremost to know that the world only exists because of the Torah where in the uh Gemara Masechet Shabbat it says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to the creation uh on uh Friday that uh, if Am Yisrael accepts the Torah at Mount Sinai then the world will continue to to uh to exist and will arrive on Shabbat uh, but if it doesn't I'm going to destroy the entire world this is the reason why the uh, 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 in the verses in Genesis in Bereshit it says uh, 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 meaning it was evening it was night it was uh, night it was day first day it was night it was day uh, second day and so on and so forth but then when it comes to the sixth day which is the day that he made the deal with uh, the two witnesses which is the uh, heaven and the earth he says uh, there was an added hey to Yom Hashishi, meaning the sixth day. So the Chachamim and Gemara Masechet Shabbat ask, why is there an added hey in this word that wasn't in all of the other uh, days? He says this hey is a symbolic of the deal that Hakadosh Baruch Hu made with the, uh, uh, in essence, with himself, with the Torah, and the witnesses were the heaven and the earth, and the hey is Gematria five, symbolic of the five books of Moses. So the world continues to exist because of the Torah and the world is built. But needless to say, there is also a Mishnah in Avot that says that if it wasn't for the Torah the, uh, and the laws of the Torah, the, uh, the people would eat each other alive. And we saw that. We saw that happen throughout history and we see it today. Uh, so uh, both are right. Uh, and it's, so it's not a machloket, but rather it's a... Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's in essence this and this are words of the living God Robert is asking in uh, I read about the laws of the primary and secondary blessings regarding food I became confused about that I was under the impression that one says the blessings in order from mezonot up to shackle with the exception of bread is above all and we only do amotzi or birkat amazon uh, please explain elaborate the laws of primary and secondary blessings regarding the food I mean it's written in the article I'm not really sure what you want me to explain uh, the uh, al is actually very good uh, I, uh, they, they explain the, uh, the things you have to uh, in short there's a primary food there's a, there's a secondary food meaning primary food meaning this is the main thing that's going to satiate you so it's a typically it's bread if it's not bread and it's something that's mezonot uh, but there are certain things that are not typically part of a meal uh, and therefore even if you've said let's say the motzi you'd still have to do a uh, etz meaning if let's say you did a motzi to eat bread uh, and uh, but uh, as part of your meal you're eating bread you're eating rice you're eating everything but then your wife decides to give you a uh, I don't know a cup of tea or coffee or uh, or an apple those things are not a typical part of a meal therefore you have to do a secondary blessing on those uh, as if you know they're they're a separate blessing uh, so there are things like that that are involved uh, in regards to uh, um, saying which blessing first, which now there are different opinions of which blessing is first, which one is second, but generally speaking, it's like you said. Uh, there is, uh, but again, it's it, it depends. It depends. There are certain circumstances. I just simply can't go over every single possible circumstance because uh, uh, I just I think it's not uh, uh, not something that I can do. Jeremy, in the uh, story where Rabbi Ishmael said. The Shema Mefarash, and then travel to the heavens. How was he allowed to use the name? Isn't the name only allowed to be used during Yom Kippur confession, Kohen Gadol? Uh, this is uh, considered something equivalent to, uh, I guess, Kabbalah Maasit, where certain people will do certain things for the sake of Klal Israel. Uh, Kabbalah Maasit is a uh, the mystical aspect of Kabbalah. Uh, that uh, very few people in the world know. It's not something you're going to learn anywhere. Uh, it's not something that you're going to find in a book either. It's something that you could only learn from a uh, you know a, 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 a kabbalist, a real kabbalist. Uh, but that real kabbalist is only going to teach you after you are already a 
extraordinary Talmud Chacham and, uh, and a scholar and uh, a very righteous person and uh, after many, many years of, uh, of toiling and, uh, and suffering that you bring on yourself and so on. But in essence, some of these Kabbalists have abilities to say specific names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in order to change nature. Uh, there's a story that Rav Mazuz said that uh, the Rambam used this uh, at least one time where he showed the, uh, the king of, uh, I think it was the king of Egypt, that he can travel from place to place uh, in an instant. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, other types of stories where uh, uh, different Chachamim did certain things in order to, uh, to help Klal Yisrael. They would say something or do a certain uh, type of uh, uh, act and somebody would die in a different state in a very unusual way. You know, all types of interesting things. Uh, but these types of things are, are not allowed to be done for an individual. They're only allowed to be done if it's for Klal Israel. So when the Chachamim and the Gemara would do certain things like this, uh, they uh, uh, would do it for Klal Israel. Uh, but also remember that there is a uh, Chachamim that was actually the Kohen Gadol. Uh, so uh, they would uh, say, they would do certain things, they would go into the Kodesh Kodashim. Uh, there is Rabbi Ishmael, uh, is a very interesting story where Kadosh Baruch Hu came to him. Uh, and it's a very uh, unusual story to say the least. Uh, but he was, uh, you know, a unique person to say the least. Uh, uh, so unique that... Uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu put the face of Malach Gavriel on him. He looked exactly like Malach Gavriel, Rabbi Ishmael. It's Kodesh Kodashim. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, are there. I would, uh, um, you know, I would say that the, the, the default uh, that a person should always have is that the, the sages are right uh, for what they did and, uh, you know, and then try to figure out how. Versus... Uh, uh, think oh maybe they made a mistake and you know, uh, I, you know they all they're always right it's just that we have to figure out why in this particular case I think it's a uh, that it was for Klali Slav and I, I believe he was a Kohen Gadol anyway uh, Ali I was asking uh, I have a question about science I'm not entirely sure how a Jew is to believe per se in Hashem huh I'm not entirely sure how a Jew is to believe per se in Hashem. Does he need to do it your way and Rabbi Mizrahi's way, which is with irrefutable proof, or the Rebbe's way, which is to be simple with God and believe based solely on the mass revelation of Mount Sinai or the supposition of in the soul? <laughs> I don't have a way. Rabbi Mizrahi doesn't have a way. Uh, the Rebbe doesn't have a way either. Uh, there is no way. There is, you teach Torah, and the person learns Torah and uh, follows it. And uh, certain things affect his neshama. Certain things don't affect his neshama. Certain things help him get closer to Hashem. Certain things don't help him clo get closer to Hashem. The key is to make sure that you're doing whatever you can in order to get closer to Hashem, in order to do the will of Hashem, full uh, full uh, proof, with, without any exceptions. Uh, uh, that's, that's the key. Uh, uh, you know, so it's, it's not a matter of uh, my way or, or, or somebody else's way. It's whatever way is going to get you to serve Hashem in the highest level, where you're going to have the highest level of fear of the Almighty, and uh, you're going to learn the most amount of Torah, and you're going to have the highest level of, of, uh, of Emunah and Bitachon. If that's going to come through my teachings, Baruch Hashem. Uh, if it's going to come through somebody else's teachings, Baruch Hashem. The key is to make sure that you're going to uh, uh, do whatever is necessary that affects your neshama. Now, as far as the way we teach, uh, we teach different things. Uh, we have a different way of communicating. Uh, it's not the only way to communicate, but it's nonetheless, it's, a, it's an effective way. Uh, but not all of my lectures affect all of my audience. Some of my lectures affect some audience. Some of my lectures affect other audience. Like, for example, the movie that uh, we just publicized with the uh, uh, scientific, the signature of God. The people that watched it literally, uh, you know, loved it so much, they started writing me letters and phone calls and messages and like, 
I mean, the people that watched it are enamored by it uh, to the equivalent of how it was like Mount Sinai. I'm sure some people that watched it maybe weren't. I don't know. I, I'm assuming some people weren't uh, as enamored by it. But the people that did watch it, a lot of them, you know, are uh, sending messages of thank yous, everything. Their whole life has changed now. And this is people that have already been watching Shuim and being part of our uh, learning on a regular basis for years. But this movie had a very, very big impact on them. But surely there are certain things that uh, certain lectures that we'll have that is not going to affect some of those very same people. You know, some people don't like it when I talk against rabbis because they simply just don't want to hear it. They know we're right. They know that it's the truth. They just don't want to hear it. They want to pretend like uh, everything is okay in the world. Okay, fine. It's their choice. I don't agree with it, but that doesn't make a difference. Point is, it's their choice. Some people don't want to uh, listen to anything but uh, whatever, specific uh, talks about emuna. So if we're talking about other things, they don't want to talk about it. So different people, uh, different things affect them. But the key is for a person to know that whoever you're listening to has to be somebody that's getting you closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And in fact, there was a chidush that I got from the Midrash Rabbah, Parashat Yitro, where it says that, uh, um, it says, Vayishma Yitro, based on the words Vayishma Yitro, and Yitro heard. So Chachamim say, Vayishma uh, Yitro, from there we learn that uh, Am Yisrael said, Naseh V'nishma. Uh, that we will uh, we will do and then we will uh, we will hear but after they sinned with the golden calf after they sinned with the golden calf they ruined it but not ruined it completely because the Kadosh Baruch Hu allowed us to do tshuva so what did they ruin they ruined half the blessing they ruined half the blessing which was nase that nase that we will do and then we will hear that nase was ruined but what we will have left, we have Nishma. So I thought perhaps since we only have for the last 3,334 years Nishma to hold us up as a nation. Perhaps that's the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu used as one of his infinite amount of reasons of why HaKadosh Baruch Hu used the internet and the media as a way for him to communicate to his children because the only thing we have left is Nishma. The only thing we have left is nishma. The only thing we have to, left is to hear. To hear, to hear. So, But the person needs to know. They have to hear the right person. They have to hear the truth. They have to be very careful of who they hear. Why? Because that's the only thing you have left. That's the only thing you have left. So if you're hearing me, or you're hearing Rav Mizrahi Sheikh, or you're hearing anybody else out there, you know, you have to make sure that you're hearing the truth, and you're hearing somebody that's getting you closer to Hashem. Making you a better servant of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, making you learn more Torah, making you have higher emunah, more uh, uh, excitement to serve Hashem and so on. But if a person is just simply pacifying you, then obviously that's not good. If a person talks about subjects that are uh, uh, you know, disgusting to you or, or, or they simply make you more distant from Hashem, then don't listen to them. You know, you have to listen and, uh, to the people that are helping you, that are getting you closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But it's not necessarily that uh, the same things that are going to work for you are going to work for somebody else, or what works for somebody else is going to work for you. Some people are fascinated, and I can even say addicted, to Torah proofs. They want Torah proofs. They want scientific proofs, medical proofs, physiological proofs, archaeological proofs, every proof they can possibly find. Some people don't necessarily care so much about the proof. They just like to learn about morality, how to be better people and more kind and more this and more that. Some people, they want to know the divinity of the Torah. They want to know mysticism, all types of different uh, miracles. And uh, some people like to hear stories, all types of extraordinary stories. Everybody has their neshama tuned in a certain way. You have to make sure that you're you know, going towards where your neshama is tuned. But again, sometimes the Yetzirah tells you that it's tuned towards the wrong direction. So you have to check yourself. You have to check yourself because like I said, you only have nishma. You only have, we will hear left. You don't have naseh. You have uh, only half the blessing that we got at Mount Sinai in essence. So a person has to be careful not to be a nishma, not to hear the wrong people, not to hear the heresy, not to hear the uh, apikosut uh, that's out there. And you have to make sure that you're testing yourself, you're checking yourself, and uh, you're, uh, you're constantly steering yourself in the right direction. 
uh, that's helping you serve Hashem in a higher level. And as long as you're serving at Hashem in a higher level on a regular basis, that means you're going in the right direction. Generally speaking, it's not recommended for people to uh, focus all of their energy on any one particular issue altogether. Doesn't matter what the issue is. It's bad uh, 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 for a person to focus all of their energy on one thing. And that's the reason why uh, we generally don't uh, focus all of our energy on one subject. We give uh, different shuim, even though there are certain things that repeat themselves where we teach morality and the different aspects of how you can learn it in different ways. Or we'll speak against the uh, immorality or, or uh, we'll speak uh, wigs, idolatry, you know, and, you know, against the Christianity and, and, and on and on. There are different things that come up on a regular basis. But it's very important for a person not to focus on one particular issue because typically those people end up falling. They end up falling, unfortunately. And there's actually a uh, Masoret uh, from one of Chachmei Israel that says that the, uh, the people that uh, uh, converted during the time of the Spanish Inquisition, the people that converted to, uh, to Christianity in order to save their life, uh, not because they necessarily believed in Christianity, but because they, uh, uh, um, they want to save their life, are people that uh, were the intellectuals. They were the intellectuals, they were the people that had scientific and medical and, and, and physiological and archaeological proofs of why HaKadosh Baruch Hu is who he is and the Torah is divine, but they still abandoned him at the moment of, uh, of truth. Whereas the people that either fleed uh, and leaving everything behind, or the people that were willing to, and died for the sake of a Torah were the simple people, meaning the people that had simple emunah, I believe in Hashem, I don't necessarily need any scientist to, uh, to show me Hashem, I already know Hashem, I see Hashem. So uh, it is, it is a, there is a uh, verse in the Torah that says that tamim tiyem Hashem, to be simple with Hashem, but it also means to be complete with Hashem. So to be simple with Hashem is okay as long as you're complete with Hashem. But if you are simple with Hashem, but that simplicity causes you to have doubts, then that, that simplicity is not complete. So you have to fill in that gap. If the gap is going to be filled through scientific proofs, medical proofs, archaeological proofs, immorality teachings, uh, teachings about genome and punishment, uh, teachings of uh, different uh, sages and how great they are, Whatever is missing in that gap, you have to put it in. So to eliminate any doubt, any doubt in your neshama and to get you to serve Hashem at the highest possible level. Whether I have the merit to be the one that's going to be the vessel to give you that truth or somebody else with, you have to make sure that you're getting it. If I have the merit, I'll, I'll be the one. Somebody else the merit, they're praiseworthy and they'll, have, they'll be the one. The key is for you to have it. That's really the key. That's the most important part. And anybody that actually cares about helping people get closer to Hashem doesn't really uh, care whether they get closer to Hashem through himself or through somebody else. They just want people to get closer to Hashem. That's, that's really the whole goal. There's no, there's no debating because it's not a battle. It's not a battle between people. It's a battle for Neshamot. You're trying to save people. So that's, that's the key. Uh, okay, uh, quick question. Chaz is asking, is the story of the Golem of Prague true? Some say it's a Baba Maisa. Uh, the Golem of Prague is a, uh, according to the information that I've looked up, is 100% true. And not only is it 100% true, there's actually a place in Prague uh, that has a, uh, a memorial for this Golem. So it's not like something that's just you'll find in books. You could actually go to a place and see the story, see the, uh, uh, the building, uh, I mean, this is a uh, real event that took place, and it's not a uh, the only time that such a thing happened. Uh, what the um, what they did, what the Chacham did, because the Goim were constantly attacking and kidnapping Jews. Uh, what uh, what uh, Chachmei Israel did, they uh, it took um, the Shem Meforash, the uh, uh, the name of Hakadosh Baruch Hu like similar to what the Kohen Gadol uh, would have on his tzitz, and they put it on, a, uh, on, the, uh, on the forehead of the uh, golem, and that gave it life. And that golem was uh, operational and protecting Am Yisrael. And uh, once uh, the, the threat stopped, which obviously took some time, 
once the threat stopped, the golem had no longer had a use. So Chacham took the uh, the uh, the, uh, the you know the, the holy name uh, uh, out of him, and uh, that's it. He went back to being nothing. But yeah, this is not necessarily the uh, the only time something like this happened. And uh, in fact, the Gaumi Vilna, the Gaumi Vilna told his Talmid, uh, is it the Gaon? Yeah, the Gaumi Vilna or the Arizal? I believe, uh, maybe the Arizal. I'm sorry, maybe the Arizal was it. Where he, uh, uh, I, for some reason, uh, my brain always confuses the Gaon and the, uh, and Arizal. Uh, but either way, one of them uh, told his uh, Talmid that uh, they were already had the uh, working knowledge and already uh, building a golem at eight years old. They were already such a Gaon, such a genius in Torah, that they were already uh, building a golem at eight years old. And uh, the Chachamim found out about it and came and, uh, you know, and they asked him to stop. They asked him not to do it. And in fact, in one of the Sfarim, I believe it's actually the Arizal now that I think about it, in one of the Sfarim, it actually gives the instructions of how to do it, how to build a golem. Uh, so this stuff exists. It's not like uh, uh, Baba Mice is for people that don't want to believe, but this stuff exists. It does exist. It has existed. There's a lot of interesting things that... Uh, Am Israel has gone through and has done, and uh, uh, it's a, there's a lot of, uh, one thing that we have uh, as a nation is we have more documented proofs for all of the things that ever happened to us than all of the nations put together. We have more documented proofs for the things that happened to us than they have uh, fictional proofs for their fictional stories. That's, that just gives you an idea. Okay, one or two more questions, and, and then we're done for the night. I still have to get some energy uh, for the next year. Steve, is it appropriate to help a Jew fulfill an obligation in the area of machloket? For example, getting a pair of Rabenu Tam tefillin for a Chabadnik that's not married, assuming the giver doesn't hold that position. Uh, I mean, I don't see how uh, spending a thousand, or two thousand, or three thousand dollars on tefillin is uh, that he's really, uh, you know, only according to the Chabadnik should be using. Uh, I'm not really sure how that's going to help him in his life uh, if he's in such a keila uh, that uh, they are re- rebuking him for not buying himself for Benu Tam tefillin. Then he should leave that keila just because of that. That's a very sick keila. Uh, but uh, the, the the point is is that uh, I don't think that you'll be smart to uh, invest in such a thing. I think it's better for you to use that same kind of money to go give an avrech money to the, somebody that learns Torah all day uh, and have them uh, you know learn Torah all month. You'll get a lot more merit for that than than for this. But as far as your last question in regards to, uh, you know, if, if the person that uh, uh, you're giving it to has a different halacha than you do or a different minhag than you do, that in itself should not stop you from helping them. You're not helping them fulfill what you want. You're helping them fulfill what they want, as long as what they want is good. That in itself shouldn't stop you from, from helping them. But generally speaking, I don't really think giving him a Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin is going to help him. Uh, why doesn't Chabad do something about Manus Friedman after it's proven that he supports pedophiles? As Chabad, I can't speak for them. Uh, as Chabad, there's a lot of things that Chabad does that uh, the world doesn't agree with and they stay quiet about. There's a lot of things that uh, other people do that uh, is forbidden that the world doesn't speak about. So you have to ask them. Uh, Shalom, are we allowed to listen to classical music? How about old Hebrew songs, old French and Persian music, all male singers? Uh, if it's uh, secular music that is talking about, you know, the love between a man and a woman and things of that nature, then no. If it's a uh, just music, if it's just instrumental, no problem, you can listen to it. Once the lyrics become, uh, you know, are involved, then it's uh, very problematic. Uh, because typically what people sing about are things that are forbidden to us. Uh, they, think of, they, they sing about girlfriends and boyfriends and uh, promiscuity 
and all types of uh, you know inappropriate behavior and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a male or female singer; it's still forbidden. Uh, so generally speaking, the uh, the the type of music that I uh, you know I could tell you that you could feel safe listening to is either Jewish music or instrumental. Instrumental uh, uh, like classical music is perfectly fine or any other type of instrumental regardless of whether it's instrumental Middle Eastern uh, uh, whether it's classical Middle Eastern or whatever it is if it's instrumental typically it's okay uh, to listen to uh, you know and uh, that's fine but once there's lyrics that's where the problems begin and typically it's forbidden. Uh, based on the Torah, Jose is asking in the Chachamim, what is the correct measure of Ishtadlut? Uh, the Ishtadlut should be based, determined based on the person's emuna. The higher the level of emuna that they have, uh, meaning the higher level their uh, faith is in Hashem and how much they believe that Hashem is monitoring everything and is going to help them, that should be uh, determined how much effort, Ishtadlut, they should exert. If they believe 100% in Hashem, that Hashem will take care of them no matter what, then they should simply learn Torah all day and never go to any regular job. If they believe in Hashem 90%, then they should work for 10% and learn Torah 90% of the time. If they believe 50%, then they should work 50% and learn Torah 50%. If they believe 10%, then they should, you know, uh, work on themselves, but they should uh, work a lot more than somebody else. So the, the effort is determined based on the, uh, on the belief. And how does a person know if they really have uh, a munay and Hashem? It's based on how much you're worrying. If you're worried, then you obviously have doubts. So the more a person has anxiety and worry, uh, the more they have to work. Uh, and meaning, work meaning uh, exert effort, ishtadlut. Okay, last question. Uh, let's see, somebody didn't ask any questions. Uh, okay, Eva, okay, you didn't ask any questions. How much does our tithe sh uh, should we save from the Bet HaMikdash? Also, will the synagogues be paying a percentage to the temple... <laughs> When it's built. Uh, save money for the Bet HaMikdash? No, you don't need to save money for the Bet HaMikdash. Uh, in fact, a uh, Gemara, the Gemara in uh, Masechet Yoma, uh, there was actually uh, originally a, uh, a, a decree that uh, people that converted to, uh, to Judaism uh, had to save a certain amount of money on the side for when the Mashiach comes. Uh, why? Because as soon as the Mashiach comes, they would have to complete their conversion that they can't complete now by bringing the sacrifice because in essence, the conversion is supposed to be the same thing that Am Yisrael did. Am Yisrael accepted the Torah, they did the Brit Milah, and they brought a sacrifice. Now a person that converts today, they accept the Torah, they do Brit Milah, obviously if it's relevant, but there's no sacrifice. So uh, the, the law was that they would have to, a, a, a convert would have to save a certain amount of money on the side, the Gemara says, uh, in order to be able to buy a cow to bring a, a sacrifice as soon as the Mashiach comes. But uh, comes Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai and canceled it. He said, no, this is not a, uh, the people can't uh, uphold such a law. And he relieved you of any, uh, any, uh, any need to save any money uh, for the Bet HaMikdash. Why? Because you can use it right now and need to use it right now to do mitzvot, to serve Hashem better now because that's what's going to help you and uh, uh, serve Hashem better and that's what's going to help HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, justify bringing the Mashiach that will build the Bet HaMikdash. So uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's, we have to be worried about today, not worried about uh, having money tomorrow. Surely if somebody has the merit to, to live, to see uh, and uh, uh, the Mashiach and the, Bet, the third Bet HaMikdash, surely HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to make a, uh, everything else that they need also available too. Uh, it's, uh, it comes as a package deal. Okay, Rabotai Karim, thank you very much for uh, learning Torah with me. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will bless each and every single one of you. 
to uh, get closer and closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to serve Hashem at the highest possible level, to help Klal Yisrael and the rest of the world do tshuva shlema, including all of the enemies of God, all of the enemies of the Torah, for them, Be'ezot Hashem, to all do tshuva, for all of Klal Yisrael to do tshuva, to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because at the end of the day, that's all we want. We want the world to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We want the world to, to, to praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We want the world to love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to fear HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu has commanded us to do because that's the whole purpose of the world. That's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world because doing all of that is for our own good, not for His. He's already perfect, but serving Him, honoring Him, fearing Him, loving Him, it's for our own good. So to do all He wants us to do for, uh, in essence, in serving Him, is in essence giving ourselves the best gift we could possibly give. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.
אני מברך, אני מברך את הרבנים, רגע, 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 אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהלכו בפי עליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, ראש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל מה שיפנו ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. אנחנו עושים בעזרת השם רשת בכל הארץ. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. במיאמי. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעבירו